Today we are going to talk about making the most of your intellectual property. Uh, Bennett and Jones, our benevolent host today, and as well as the sponsor of the session. Uh, I will be very, very quick because we do have seven speakers, believe it or not. And uh, Dominic has put together this at a very short notice. That's a great job. Allow me to introduce Dominic, and then she will take over the session. Dominic uh, Hasse is the Intellectual Property Litigation Practice Group Leader here. Her practice emphasizes pharmaceutical litigation and trademark prosecution. It involves litigating and negotiating and structuring settlements of all types of intellectual property disputes. Before joining Bennett and Jones, Dominic practiced with a law firm in New York where she provided litigation and counseling services to pharmaceutical and consumer product companies. She is competent in the area of payments, trade secrets, and false advertising, with particular focus on Hatch-Waxman Act and Medicare Modernization Act payment litigation. She has uh, had several publications, such as in Canadian Intellectual Property Law Review, Journal of Generic Medicines. She is admitted to the United States District Courts for the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York, and the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. She is a member of Intellectual Property Institute of Canada and advocates society and the New York Intellectual Property Law Association. And as far as I'm concerned, she's a great savior because just within the last seven to 10 days, she's put together this great session. Please help me welcome Dominic Hasse. Thank you very much. Well, I alone did not put this session together. I'm doing a small part of it. It was with the considerable help of the remainder of the intellectual property, intellectual property litigation, and international uh, IT group that uh, you will be hearing from tonight. And I'm just realizing that, and that's the list of the speakers you'll hear from. So we're very pleased to have this opportunity to address you tonight on some of our favorite topics. Uh, the topics of intellectual property are certainly not to everyone's taste. Uh, we find ourselves avoiding talking shop with our friends at parties as we see their eyes glaze over when we talk about the intricacies of patent prosecution or uh, licensing arrangements. But you as entrepreneurs know that these details do apply to you. You know that the economic value of a company is no longer just about how much product it can sell or the real estate or the objects that the company owns. There's also significant economic control and power in the ideas and the brand and the goodwill and the technology behind the products and services of the company. So these are actual assets. So what is intellectual property? It's generally the creative ideas and expressions of the human mind. And these expressions generally have commercial value. And they can receive legal protection just like any other form of tangible property can. IP is an asset that can be bought, it can be sold, it can be licensed, it can be given away just like any other kind of property. And the IP owner has the right to prevent the unauthorized use for the sale of the property, but only if that property is properly protected. It is different from other property because it's intangible. The IP is not in the actual machine built or in the book that's written. Uh, these are some expressions of the unauthorized use. A lot of the revenue in the software industry is not in any physical form. It's actually in the licensing rights, the rights to use the software and the rights to reproduce the software. So you may own the medium in which that software is fixed, but you don't get to do whatever you want just because you own it. So the IP behind the expressions is protected by a variety of different <coughs> rights, many of which we will be discussing this evening. As entrepreneurs, you definitely have to understand what these different forms are. IP assets are important tools to increase value and to attract investors. Proper IP protection is needed to assure investors that their investment is actually likely to have value. 
properly protected IP can be sold or it can be licensed for a fee or royalty as a real revenue generator, or it can be used defensively against competitors. And there's value in all of that. But without understanding IP or what's your right, what your rights are, and without protecting it following the specialized procedures that are put into place by legislation or by virtue of the common law, you can lose that important asset. So every entrepreneur should really be engaged in a continuous SWOT analysis. So strengths. What IP do I have? And is it protected? And if not protected, what weaknesses do I have? What IP do I need that I don't have? that I need to be able to run my business to make myself attractive to investors? And what opportunities do I have? Can I develop additional IP or acquire additional IP or license it or tell my investors to do these things? And then the threats. What my IP might inf infringe and can I work around it? Can I do without it? But again, to do these things you need to understand what those IP rights are. And then you have to figure out who's going to take care of these things for you in your organization. So with that, uh, we turn to the first two forms of IP that I'm going to talk about, followed by my colleagues who will talk about other aspects of IP, trademarks and copyright. Starting with copyright. What is it? At its most basic, it is the exclusive right to reproduce a work, but there is obviously more to it than that. Copyright arises automatically, and it exists in the original product of labor, skill, and judgment that's fixed in a tangible form. It has to be original, but original doesn't mean it has to be new in some way. That's the province of patent. It means that it has, it has to originate from the author. And fixation just means it needs to be recorded in some way, so or on paper, or on a hard drive, on a CD, or DVD. And it doesn't have to be particularly creative. The work doesn't have to be particularly creative to be protected. It can be numbers, it can be forms. Uh, a menu is protectable through copyright. What kinds of works are copyrightable? Generally artistic works, and this can be a range of things. It can be sculptures, logos, brochures, photographs, blueprints, literary works, and this can include books, obviously, poems, software, importantly, uh, musical works, and it can be music with or out, without words, and it was not always so. And dramatic works, which would include plays, commercials on TV, etc. But copyright does not apply to every aspect of these works. So, for example, whereas copyright protects a song, it doesn't protect the title of the song. And whereas it protects a novel, it doesn't protect the plot of that novel. And whereas it protects a magazine, it doesn't protect an article, it wouldn't protect the facts in that magazine article. And whereas it would protect the computer program, it wouldn't protect the name of that computer program or what it does or how it functions, although these latter rights might be the province of trademark law or patent law. So the content of the copyright is the exclusive right to produce and reproduce, to translate, to adapt to different media, public performance, and in some cases to import a copyrighted work, to sell, to publish, and importantly, to authorize others to do these things with a copyrighted work. Copyright lasts quite a long time. It's 50 years from the author's life, not the owner's life, the author's life, the end of the author's life. And you will have seen copyright markings on books and internet content, etc. the C in a circle followed by the date and the name. That marking is required in some countries. It's not required in Canada, but it's not a bad idea because it puts others on notice that copyright is asserted in a particular work and as of when, and it makes infringement of that copyright harder to defend. And uh, likewise, copyright can be registered. It doesn't have to be registered, but it's one of the easiest intellectual property registrations to obtain. And there are benefits to registration. Uh, it makes it easier to prove ownership if ever infringement of the copyright is asserted in court. And it also adds clarity in the event that you license or assign the copyright. It makes it clear exactly what the copyrighted work is that is the subject of that transfer uh, or rental of property. Moral rights are also an aspect of copyright law. They're unusual. Uh, they're the concept of having the right to the integrity of the work. So uh, a work cannot be modified that's to the prejudice of an author's reputation. For example, by drawing a mustache on a portrait painted by an artist. 
it's also an association right, so the right to have a name associated with the work, or not to be associated with the work, as the case may be. And these, unlike other copyrights, are rights that can be uh, cannot be assigned. They can be waived, but they can't be assigned. And there's a bit of an oddity in Canadian law, these reversionary <laughs> rights. If the author is the first owner of the copyright, and more on that later, any assignment goes back to the estate of the author 25 years after the author's death. And so that's something to be aware of if a corporation, for example, is not the first owner of the copyright. And it doesn't matter if there is an assignment in writing, this reverts. It goes back to the estate unless a separate arrangement is made with the estate. And what is copyright infringement? That's basically doing anything that the owner of the copyright has the exclusive right to do. So copying a work or changing a work, not giving credit um, is infringement of moral rights. So there is a right to sue and to receive compensation in court or to have a court stop the infringer from doing what it's doing. Uh, that is the value in having copyright protection. That is the underlying value you give in the license in a copyright. It's the right not to have the court visit these remedies on you. That's the threat that causes people to pay good money for licensing rights. There are, of course, exceptions. Not everything is copyright infringement. If a work is copied for private study or research, or for review or criticism, or for news reporting, that's not infringement. A single copy uh, for backup of a computer program, if you otherwise own the computer program itself in its fixed form and the right to use it. Uh, it's a complicated assessment whether you infringe or not, so it is best if you are unsure to consult a lawyer. To entrepreneurs, it is important to establish who actually owns the copyright in work, especially if it is an important business asset, as it often is. When ownership is not clear and parties get to dis into disagreements, they end up in court. And the court will apply the following rules. If there's a proper agreement in place as to ownership, the court will enforce it. If there isn't, the author is the first owner of the copyright. But if the author, author is an employee and developed the work in the scope of employment, then the employer owns the copyright. And there might be some gray areas surrounding this. For example, a director or officer might not be an employee. So if a director or officer is the person generating the right, that director or officer might be the first owner in the copyright, not the corporation. It's best to get these things in writing ahead of time. So it's very clear who is going to own the copyright if an employee, director or officer, or anybody else involved in the corporation is making copyrightable works that are going to be important to your organization. There can be joint owners in copyright. If more than one person has made a substantial contribution to a single work, they're co-authors, and they all share in the copyright in the whole. But if individual contributions can be distinguished, then there may be separate copyrights in the work attributable to the contribution of each author. And there can be copyright in compilations, in groups of separately copyrightable works. So for example, a journal. Each article in a journal might be separately copyrightable, but if it took skill and judgment to compile the group of journal articles, the journal as a whole would also be copyrightable, protectable under a separate copyright owned by a separate entity or individual. And derivative works, works that derive from other copyrighted works, can also have their own copyright as long as there has been enough exercise of skill or judgment to transform that other copyrighted work to something else worthy of copyright. And now a virtual coffee break as we move on to trademarks. I put these slides up to illustrate that more than one right can exist in the same thing. And my partner, Trent Horton, will pick up on this, uh, on this theme with respect to different IP rights. So when I purchase a cup of coffee, Starbucks coffee, I own the cup but I don't own the intellectual property that is displayed on the cup. So here we have an artistic work on the cup. It, it's a drawing. It's printed. There's copyright in that. And I don't know how the uh, assignment of rights has been worked out, but I'm almost certain that that copyright belongs to Starbucks Corporation. 
But in addition, Starbucks has a trademark in this design. Not just in the designs that it used before 2011 that actually say Starbucks coffee on it, but also in the design on its own, as long as when people see that design, they know that the coffee that comes inside that cup with that design comes from a single source. And even better if they know that that single source is Starbucks. And so there's copyright in that, there's trademark in that, and I don't own it just because I own that cup. So there's a real distinction between the goods or the services and the intellectual property behind those goods or services. So your trademark is also a very important intellectual property asset. It distinguishes your brand, it distinguishes your organization, and symbolizes your reputation. So the selection of a trademark is critical. Now when your reputation is associated with your trademark, that's when it has value. So for example, a trademark might have the value that attracts franchisees and want to, so that people want to uh, be part of your organization and sell your wares under that trademark. They think they'll do well because there's a good reputation associated with that trademark. And it's certainly an important asset uh, to sell products and to sell services. A trademark is essentially anything that distinguishes one business product or service from that of another source. A trademark doesn't have to be registered, it can be registered or unregistered, and you'll all be familiar with the R in the circle, and, or the TM designation. TM means trademark, R means registered trademark. If your trademark has not been registered in a particular jurisdiction, by which I mean country, you may not use that R in a circle, it's not allowed. Your trademark has to be registered to use that R in a circle. There aren't many limitations on what a trademark can be as long as the Canadian Intellectual Property Office accepts it as a trademark distinguishing source. Generally, so far, it appears to need to be something that has to be, that can be seen or at least heard, but there is room for change in the future. The key concept in trademarks and the key way to protect your trademarks is use and by using it. The reason why use is clear, uh, it, the reason why use is, is important, excuse me, is fairly clear. If trademark is not used, if it's not known by other people, others cannot associate a single source with that trademark. It can't distinguish your business. So those who have used their trademarks have done it well. And there's simply no question where, uh, the, what the source of the words or services are. And as a few key examples, there's no question what the source of those services are. And this is true even if there aren't words associated with the trademark. So I showed you earlier the Starbucks logo that didn't have Starbucks coffee, but would still in all likelihood be recognized by the public in general uh, to, to distinguish Starbucks as opposed to, say, a second cup. People know what that is, notwithstanding the fact that there are no words associated with it. And if you have children, you might know <laughs> what this is. It's very popular in my household, but Goldfoot, it's a goldfish crackers. And this is known as the distinguishing guise. So you can see the shape of your wares can be uh, a trademark if it is well enough known and has acquired enough distinctiveness so people know that it comes from a single source. Another example, there's no question that this is the distinguishing guise of Coke. And so Coke can use this as a trademark. So although a trademark doesn't have to be registered, there are benefits to registration. And for it to be a valuable asset, you should register. If you register, you get Canada-wide protection. If someone seeks to use your trademark to try to distinguish his or her words or services, or a corporation's words or services. Otherwise, a trademark owner is stuck trying to enforce their trademark on a province-by-province -province basis, which is expensive, difficult, and probably largely ineffectual. Registering a trademark also assists in licensing the trademark. Trademark, again, for clarity. It's very clear what right is being licensed, if there's a registration to point to. It also provides more tools in court for enforcing rights. 
a registered, a registered trademark owner can bring a right in trademark infringement. An unregistered trademark is more limited in the rights that it can seek to enforce. It's much harder to stop a third party from using an unregistered trademark than it is a registered trademark. And for that reason, from an investor perspective, a registered trademark has greater value. And the term is 15 years renewable indefinitely as long as there is use. Now, not everything can be a trademark. For example, a name, something that's known primarily or merely as a name or surname, can't be a trademark. A trademark can't describe the products or services with which it is associated. So, sweet is not a good trademark for ice cream. A trademark can't deceive the public as to the quality of the product or services. So, pure dairy would not be a great trademark for a soy beverage. It can't contain the name of a place of origin where people expect certain goods to come from. So Seville is probably not a good trademark for oranges. Nor can a trademark be the name in another language of the goods in question. So for example, a gelato for ice cream, not a good trademark. Nor can a trademark be a purely functional aspect of a product. But if that aspect has novelty, it might be the uh, subject of patent instead. And of course, a trademark cannot be registered if it's confusing with another trademark that's already out there. And the key issue is, in fact, confusion and infringement. The question, uh, well, according to the Trademarks Act, trademarks are confusing if both marks are used in the same general area, and the use leads consumers to believe that the goods and services originate from the same source. And the test is whether and the average consumer with an imperfect recollection would be so confused. So as an example, and I hope this isn't a real life example, I don't think it is, Apple for use in association with iPad might be confusing with pineapple used in association with iPad. And if not considered confusing, it might improperly trade off of the goodwill of Apple, which is also an infringement of trademark rights. But just because you register a trademark does not mean you have a total monopoly over the trademark use. The registration only provides the monopoly in connection with the particular goods and services with which the mark is registered. So identical trademarks can coexist without confusion, and one example is Delta faucets and Delta Airlines, or Apple for Autoglass and Apple for iPads. My colleague Jayla Chen will be elaborating on this some more, but to maximize the value of your trademarks, you need to ensure consistent and continuous use. Don't abandon your trademark. Don't change the way it looks. This can jeopardize your trademark registration. Don't let others use your trademark unless there's a proper license under which you control the character and the quality of the services or the wares associated with it. If you do that, it can cause your trademark to lose distinctiveness and jeopardize the registration of your trademark. Don't let your trademark become the name of your product or services through long-term uses, as it was a problem for Hollanderizing for dry cleaning or a Hoover for some time for vacuums. You can recover from those after a great deal of advertising dollar expenditures, but it's best just to make sure that people do not refer to your products or services using your trademark as the name. That genericizes your trademark. All of these things put your trademarks in jeopardy. Now, there are other aspects of intellectual property, lesser known, lesser used, and one example is industrial design. And that is the exclusive right to use any original shape, configuration, pattern, or ornamentation of industrially produced objects. And that is judged solely by the eye. Now, that is very difficult to understand. But it is different from trademark because it's not an applied mark that distinguishes wares. It's different from copyright. We're not talking about a sculpture. We're talking about an industrially produced article. And that article has to have some function that's apart from the design that's sought to be protected by an industrial design. So an example is a lamp. Uh, a lamp, all lamps work in roughly the same way, but we'll, use incand we'll talk about incandescent bulbs and a stand, a vase perhaps. Uh, that's the functional aspect of the lamp, 
but the vase part of the lid can be a variety of different shapes, and that shape might be protectable by industrial design. Another example is faucets. They all function in more or less the same way. They're industrially produced, but the particular shaping and the, the way in which a design is applied may be protectable by industrial design. Another example, very distinctive chairs, different chair designs. That may be the subject of industrial design. The term of an industrial design uh, is five years, which is renewable for an additional five years, and that's the maximum. And that, for the person who owns an industrial design registration, has the exclusive use to apply that design to the article, to that functional article, for importation, rent, and sale. Very briefly, Another right is plant breeders' rights, and that is the exclusive, exclusive right to sell and produce propagating material registered for plant varieties. As long as that variety or that material is new, so it hasn't been previously sold, it's different from other varieties, it's uniform so that all plants in the variety are the same, and it's stable, so each generation would be the same. That's a protectable right, a registrable, protectable right that can be licensed and sold with value. And integrated circuit topography is another area. Um, that is the exclusive right to, to reproduce, manufacture, import, or export original topographies, or, for example, semiconductor chips, incorporating the topography or any part of it. So that gives you the exclusive right to reproduce that three-dimensional topography or to commercially exploit circuitry that uh, incorporates that topography. Obviously, that is for an esoteric and relatively isolated group of people, but that is another uh, protectable intellectual property right that can be assigned, licensed, etc. And the term for that is 10 years from commercialization or filing. And with that, I turn it over to my partner and colleague, Trent Horn, who will be speaking with you about trade secrets and patents. Thank you very much. Random number is not protected or what? They can be if it involves the exercise of judgment and skill. If it's compilation, if their compilation somehow involves the exercise of judgment or skill. Uh, okay, thank you. Sure. So, the trademarks, if I'm using a PM symbol, yes. can I get it on when it registered and start using the register? Absolutely. It doesn't preclude registration, and you can use the TM symbol with a registered mark without getting into trouble, but you cannot use an R symbol with an unregistered mark without getting into trouble. If I'm getting into trouble, so somebody is stopping it, and I want to protect myself, but by that time I was only using the TM symbol, can I just go ahead and register it to get the protection right at that time? You can. You can do that. Yes. But it has to be registered before you have the benefits of registration in the context of litigation. And you may not want the infringement to go on for as long as it might while you wait for that uh, trademark to be registered. So the relief would only be up to the point of registered, not before? Yes. That you'd be able to rely on the benefits of registration. I know you mentioned that the title of a book can't be copied. Is it copyrightable? And I'm wondering, what about the name of a company? That would be the subject of trade name protection or trademark protection, depending on how that name is used. So that wouldn't be the subject of copyright, but that, that is a very uh, common question or misconception. Okay, so if you had company name with the, a copyright symbol at the, at the end of it, that kind of means nothing. That means nothing. That's right. There are some things to change. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, the question I have, um, you showed a, a biscuit, um, goldfish. Yes. Is uh, what, under what category would that be? Uh, trademark, a patent, or uh, because it's got a specific shape. It does, and that, that's trademark. That's a distinguishing guise. It's a it's a look. It's a mark. It's a particular shape that actually distinguishes those wares. Right. Okay. Um, how close or far would you need to be to not be within the scope of that patent? 
the, 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 the trademark, right, not the patent, the, uh, it would not, in order not to infringe that trademark. It would be a question of confusion, and there are various factors to consider, and uh, the factors are all really, well, in part directed to, to determining how distinctive that mark is to begin with, and have to be distinctive probably in order to receive that protection to begin with. But the real issue is whether uh, uh, the ordinary consumer would be confused and actually believe that your mark emanated from the same source. Right. We have the last question. Right? Okay. So, when I talk about logo, let's say I use logo maker software and create a logo that can be trademarked. It depends. If, if it is not confusing and doesn't uh, contravene some of those other aspects that I talked about, it's not already generic, it's not primarily or merely a surname, uh, it, it's not confusing with something already out there, it, it's not descriptive in any way, yes, it may well qualify as a trademark. Well, no, it just needs to be used and be distinctive in order to generate trademark protection. But there are additional benefits from registering after the fact. But if the question is whether it matters that it was, uh, it was automatically generated as opposed to being an actual product of the mind, it doesn't matter for trademark protection. What matters is that it actually be used in association with wares or services and it actually distinguish those wares or services as to source. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Yeah.